Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Are you in a state of objective need? Do you have enough to eat? Do you have enough to drink? Do you have a place to live? Do you have access to clean water? Do you have people who can help you when you can't do things alone? Are you blind? Are you deaf? Do you have an illness to which there is no cure? There are all things, these are all things that signify genuine need. If you lack food, water, shelter, as the children told us, eventually you will die. You need those things. If you are alone, you'll be overwhelmed at some point with despair. You'll encounter numerous things upon which you cannot finish or do them by yourself. Even down to like small, dumb things. I learned this just a week ago or so because we put a lopsided load in our washing machine which caused it to move in front of the door. And we couldn't get the door open. My wife had an appointment she had to go to, and so I spent the better part of an hour trying to figure out how to move this thing, get the door open, so we could get in our utility room. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it until until my wife got home, and then we did it together, because I needed an extra point of leverage. We need other people. If you have a physical disability or a disease, which you cannot do anything about, you live in a state of need. Yet there remains one area of need unaddressed by all of these sorts of questions. Are you able to stop sinning? Are you able to purely worship God? Can you stop yourself from lusting after that beautiful woman or man in your thoughts? Can you prevent yourself from getting angry when things don't go your way or when you suffer? Can you prevent yourself from worrying about the future? Can you resist trying to take control of everything? Can you choose to do the right thing every time? The answer, of course, to all of those questions is a resounding no. A frustratingly resounding and inescapable no. You are in a state of objective need. Which means Jesus is preaching to you today. You are not the spiritually righteous. You are not the holy and upright. You are, as he said, the poor in spirit. Yet, you are blessed. What the heck does that mean? Well, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You remember that from last week, the completion of the setup in Matthew for the public ministry of Jesus, and those are the first public words, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And today we're about to find out exactly what the kingdom of heaven is all about. As we listen to the words of Jesus and meditate on the text that is known as the Sermon on the Mount, Today we focus on the doorway to that message called the Beatitudes. And really, unless one understands the Beatitudes and goes through that doorway, they're not ready to hear what Jesus has to say. They're not ready to receive the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. The first beatitude, perhaps most importantly, 
begins with a completely gracious declaration that all can hear, identify, and claim. For it is the poor in spirit, which is all people apart from Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Understanding that you are the poor in spirit will be the opening that opens the meaning for the rest of what Jesus has to say. That you and I are in a state of objective need. Something that without which we will die a complete death. The rest of what Jesus has to say will make no sense to you unless you receive this word in faith and believe that in fact you are poor in spirit. You are one of those who has no spiritual life, no righteousness of your own. And that realization leads to sadness and it leads to pain. But Christ is calling you blessed, one of the blessed ones. He has come to give you what you lack, namely a spirit, a spirit that gives life, a spirit that gives hope. So after this first general beatitude in verse 3, where the promise is made in the present tense, for those who hear this very word of Jesus and believe it, he doesn't say theirs will be, he says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven that is at hand belongs to the poor in spirit, in faith, right now. It is yours right now. And that's a key aspect to understand the dynamic that is about to come into play in these next Beatitudes, because they follow a different format. They follow this future certain hope equals present comfort. A now and not yet tension that we get with our Lord Jesus Christ, who has fully accomplished God's plan of salvation on the cross and in the empty grave. The kingdom of heaven is yours. And yet its full consummation is yet to come. So in verse 4, the tense switches for the blessing. It's no longer given in the present. It says, they shall be, they will be. It becomes a future promise. But not the sort of future promise that just is for then, but that certain future hope changes your present now. Think about it for a moment, that maybe you're in that last week of work before your vacation, and it's just becoming unbearable. What sustains you in the present is the future promise, the future hope you have of going on your vacation seven days from now. And so the promise of future hope in Jesus is such that it changes us even now. Well, this is paired, verses 3 and 4 are paired together, because what comes from somebody who is blessed as those who are poor in spirit by Jesus. Your eyes have been opened to the real state of being that you live in, and now you're sorrowful. You're sorrowful. You mourn your sin. You mourn your lack of what is good. For now Christ has blessed you, and yet you remain incomplete. You remain sinful. That sorrow arises out of our natural spiritual bankruptcy, our objective lack of something that we need. And here Jesus preaches to those that he will bring them comfort. Is that you? 
the one who despite the blessing of the gospel of the kingdom and the kingdom of heaven being theirs yet still, you sin. Yet still, you fail. For you, Jesus brings comfort. Some comfort now and ultimate comfort when he returns. Now, this isn't a calling for you to mourn, but it's recognizing that to be a blessed one who is yet poor in spirit, you will have sorrow. Sin is still around within you and within the world. Sorrow over the manifestations of sin in the world, death of a loved one, disease, and sin within yourself. The failure to live up to what God is calling you to do. And your genuine sorrow over your inability to do it. Then we get to the meek and the lowly, which again refers to not an attitude, but an objective state of being. It's not referring to being bashful or easily trodden on. It's referring to the state of being powerless. One who is at the mercy of another. Again, this is a spiritual state. And it refers to why if I ask you to stop sinning, you just can't do it. You're enslaved to the oppressive power of Satan and your own sins. So am I. But you are blessed because to those he has promised that they will inherit the earth. And that is a future end times promise of a new creation, freed from all of those things that oppress us now, that leave us powerless. When anyone comes to believe these paradoxical blessings apply to them, they're entering through the doorway of the Beatitudes to receive the present blessing, the kingdom of heaven, which is already there, and the future hope and fulfillment of all those things on the last day. And when you are powerless and poor in spirit, and yet God is blessing you through Jesus, we, like those whom Jesus ran across in his ministry, cry out for mercy. We hunger and thirst for the thing that we do not have. Renew a right spirit within me, and cast me not away from your salvation. We ask for that gift of the Holy Spirit, just like the blind Bartimaeus story where he cries out to Jesus, have mercy on me. The spiritually powerless are for those, those are for whom Jesus has come. Now we get to verse 7, and in verse 7 there's a shift in the description of the disciples of Jesus. First, he's informed us who he's come to serve. He's come to serve those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are powerless, and those who are thirsting and hungering for that which they lack. He has come to bring it. And once he has brought it, in verse 7, we get these um, descriptions of these disciples now and the way that they begin to be transformed to behave. These aren't exhortations to behavior, but they're descriptions of the changed behavior of the disciple of Jesus. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This sort of mercy is impossible until one has received mercy from God. And indeed we have. And so we begin to be merciful. Mercy and blessings to those who have nothing but need. 
nothing but inability and nothing but hunger and thirst. Now the promise to those who have received that mercy and have begun to be merciful themselves. Not perfectly merciful, of course, but it has begun in the mercy of Jesus. And that mercy will become complete on the last day. You will receive the mercy of the gospel of the kingdom. No longer standing in the wrath of God's judgment, but in the grace of his son Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart refers to those who come to worship the one true God alone. That they have not gone to worship other gods or vain idols or split their worship between God and themselves or God and something of the world. That now that they have received his mercy and he's beginning to supply what they lack, they come to him in worship. And for those that do, they shall see him. We begin to see God even now as his disciples, and we will see him even more fully when he returns in glory. And last in this section is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Peacemakers are those who bring the message of peace, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, so that others may have the peace that Jesus brings. They shall be called sons of God. One cannot do that unless one has first received the message of the peace of Jesus themselves. And then they are sent out. Those who are going out peacemaking, sometimes you will be persecuted. If you talk about the things of Jesus, you will face rejection, harm, mockery, disdain, even in some cases, death. These are the things our brothers and sisters in Christ experience all over the world every day. But blessed are they for they will be called sons of God. Another promise of the full and blessed inheritance that is to come. And when these things occur, Jesus promises his blessing. Blessing in the midst of those sufferings. And he reminds again, after this this persecution statement, he frames what we started with in verse 3, with the present promise, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is what sustains the disciple of Jesus in the midst of this life caught between the tension of now and not yet. Is the hope we have in the certain future promise of the fulfillment of all of these blessings in Jesus. This is how you can rejoice when others revile you and hate you. Why? Because your reward is great in heaven. For the kingdom of heaven is yours even now. That is the forgiveness of sins. That is life. That is a relationship that is made right with God through the work of Jesus Christ. So what now? Well, you may not have noticed, but in verse 11, there's an important shift in the Beatitudes. The they of all the Beatitudes prior becomes you in the final one. It's no longer a third person address, but a second person address. Because the Beatitudes are describing the disciples of Jesus, of which you are one. And what follows after this is not for some objective they, but it is for you, the disciple of Jesus. In Beatitudes 1 through 4, it is describing 
the state of being of all of us before Christ comes into our lives. We are poor in spirit. We have nothing. We have no ability. We have no righteousness of our own. Yet, these ones, you are blessed by Jesus, for he has come to give you what you lack. He has come to give you the thing that you need. The good news is being preached to you. In Beatitudes 5 through 7, the disciples is beginning to be transformed by this good news of the kingdom. He is beginning to show mercy. She is beginning to worship truly. He is beginning to bring the peace of Jesus further into the world to where the Lord calls him. And in Beatitudes 8 and 9, the disciples' life is not always happy or easy. He will face suffering and persecution because of the very gospel he brings. But even then, he will be blessed. Dear friends in Christ, this is you. Jesus is preaching to you. He has come to bring the kingdom of heaven to you, and he has done so. It is yours. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, for only when the disciple of Jesus understands these realities are you ready to hear what he has to say next. So dear friends in Christ, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. In the name of Jesus, amen.